Hey everybody, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. We got the boys back together and today we're talking about some more charismatic teachings that go a little too far. You guys stay tuned, it's going to be a great episode. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, we've got a lot of great content that we're covering. You saw there in the thumbnail, we've got uh, some teachings from Joshua Mills, uh, from a, a guy by the name of uh, Dave Hayes. Uh, and then we have Kat Kerr, who you've seen on the show before. Uh, we're just going to be playing some clips, reviewing some of those teachings. But before we dive into that content, I want to remind you that we're an entirely crowdfunded ministry. There are links in the description if you would like to give. You can give on PayPal or you can give on Patreon. If you give on PayPal, uh, you can be a one-time gift. If you give on Patreon, you can go... A uh, reoccurring gift as low as five bucks a month and you get access to extra content uh, like discernment ministry stuff. We've done stuff with Elijah Stevens from Bethel, but we've also done stuff with Stephen Van Cars. Uh, really varying positions on what we're talking about today and discerning teachings and whether those kinds of things can affect uh, our spirit through demonic spirits and demonic oppressions. I also want to remind you guys uh, that there is a free ebook uh, in the a description of this video that you can download today, though may man may not perceive it. It's an ebook on how you can hear the voice of God uh, worthy of your download if you're interested. Anyway, uh, guys, fellas, uh, how are you doing uh, over there? Uh, first, I, I suppose I should, who should I, who wants to go first? Is, is one of you? Uh, I don't know. Miller, you go first, buddy. What's up? Basement boy. I'm just typing something mean about Roundtree in the chat. Um, <laughs> I'm doing good. Is that, I was in, uh, <laughs> I'm waiting for it to come up. Roundtree <laughs> cannot grow a beard. What? <laughs> this is the second toad in a it's row. It's harsh. You guys you know, when you're on my <laughs> oh, oh my god! Too far. Uh, one of these days he'll hit puberty. Uh, I'm doing good, man. I was in. Uh, I was at Praying Abbott for that. with Jack for that. last weekend, which was fun. Did y'all see the picture I posted of me out there with, uh, or of Jack actually uh, teaching oh, yeah. in a classroom at Harvard? I commented on it. I was like, next time you get into a debate on Remnant between mm -hmm. me and Michael, you should be like, look, I've been to Harvard. And you can just, you know, but, uh, I guess shut down the conversation with authority and appeal to I, authority. Yeah. <laughs> I, I question, Miller, is how is that like, how are you doing? I went to Harvard. Like, <laughs> help us. <laughs> Help us understand like that sort of transition there and how that worked out in your mind. It was a nice segue. Uh, well, <laughs> let me, I can explain it. I can explain it. You know, <laughs> Michael, if you just let me lay hands on your beard, you might grow something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hold on, Josh. Michael Roundtree, uh, just... please tell me how you are doing. <laughs> Keep I, this conversation going. I, this is actually a gorgeous beard. By the, I I just think it's incredible, but uh, no, nah, I'm doing good. Uh, we'll get back on subject here. So you guys should check out if you haven't already our Monday episode. We uh, we interacted with Dr. Paul King. If you haven't heard of him, he did a lot of research into the Word of Faith movement. We've done a lot of episodes on the Word of Faith movement. Uh, and in fact, had someone in the Patreon chat asking, "Hey, I've got relatives in the in the Word of Faith movement. You know, what do you recommend? I recommend a show or two. This would definitely be uh." All Something we'd write people on Word of Faith. So he's a little more sympathetic to Word of Faith than we are. Uh, I, I will put that out there, but he's super noble. So that's something I appreciated. Uh, I think he's just very gracious, uh, to be honest. So uh, anyway, that's a, that was a Monday episode. And, uh, and then excited about today. Now, today's episode, uh, we, we've kind of gone down a bunny trail, but it was like a demanded bunny trail. It, it's a bunny trail that you guys have been asking for, you, our viewers, uh, because it, you know we got off into some false charismatic teams and then didn't finish it. You guys were like, just do another episode. So we did another episode. And we did. We had some more. So anyway, this is part three. This is gonna be the last one of our little bunny trail of charismatic teachings, doctrine, demons that have gone too far. Then we're gonna shift back to the the. <laughs> we're gonna still be talking about demons, but uh, just spirit is what we're gonna talk about last week. So we had started this whole thing with we had talking about the Leviathan spirit, the Python spirit, the I don't know whatever the other spirits are, the Jezebel spirit. And this uh, coming week, we're gonna do the real spirit, um, also known as uh, Michael Miller. So um, anyway, sorry. 
<laughs> he still mu- <laughs> muted himself. You can't hear him. Laughing. He muted himself. It it actually makes it worse because it's like I was expecting a reaction. Nobody's laughing. Just stone silence. <laughs> just silence. Like, like so many most of, my of jokes, Michael's it's sermon really... jokes, he says it, and then oh! the audience just waits Stairs. for the punchline. Dude. It's like, how's it, guys? I just. I just wait for the sympathy laugh and then count it as a real laugh in my mind. That's how I live. Uh, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about charismatic teachings that have yeah. gone too far. So, uh, Josh, where do we start this conversation? Yeah, let's jump in real here, right here. The, the first conversation we had was on Kundalini stuff. Uh, are these manifestations enough to say, well, that's a demon? We decided no. Okay. In our next video, we looked at some charismatic teachings. Are these teachings sufficient to demonize someone? And it wasn't just like historic charismatic teaching or people who believe in the gifts. We all believe in the gifts here. We all practice the gifts here. Uh, you know, that's what Miller was doing at Harvard was he was teaching on the gifts. He was, well, Jack was teaching on the gifts. You were probably practicing the gifts publicly. Um, but that's, we're really into that. We love that kind of stuff. But there are these kinds of fringe movements that are getting more and more popular uh, that keep coming out with these really new teachings. And as we look at the scriptures, it seems as if uh, that there are teachings that bring different spirits with them. And, and these spirits, uh, these teachings are demonically inspired. Um, and these are things that we have to be careful of. We don't want to uh, begin to believe things that are mythological, that we don't want to believe things that are speculative. We don't want to believe things uh, that someone concocted or they figured out from some kind of uh, experience when they went to heaven. Uh, we believe that everything necessary for a life of godliness and salvation can be found in the scriptures. We don't have to go beyond what was written uh, and in fact, that was one of the verses that we talked about in uh, 1 Corinthians 4, I believe, not to go beyond what is written, which is apparently a creed in the early church. Um, it's what we would, in the Protestant space, would say sola scriptura, but in the first century, they had a creed of their own, don't go beyond what is written. So we want to encourage that, but we also want to listen to a few of these teachings to see if they qualify uh, to be doctrines of demons. I'll toss it over to uh, Michael Miller or Michael Roundtree if either of you want to kind of unpack what would qualify as a doctrine of demons that would open someone up to being oppressed. So, uh, I'll, I'll let Miller. Michael comment on that, but, but uh, I would say, I, I mentioned last week how I even bought into some of the stuff when I was in a more uber charismatic church. And the temptation is real for most people. They, they buy into this stuff because at the end of the day, they want to see God do amazing things. And they want to see people healed. They want to see uh, God speak and touch hearts and continue to, to sanctify. Um, but they don't realize that, that some of what is being handed out there as, uh, as teachings that could help you gain more are actually not necessarily biblical and if anything can be damaging. And so that's sort of the reason we get behind this. So, uh, Michael, go ahead. Sure. Well, I, I always like to the direct scripture. Uh, we read this last week, but it bears repeating. Uh, first Timothy. Now the spirit expressly says that in a latter later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits, teachings of demons uh, through the entity of liars whose consciences are seared who forbid marriage and require abstinence from uh, from foods that God needed to be received from thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth for everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rece- rejected if it's received with thanksgiving. It's made whole God in prayer. Okay, so in that context, he seems to be taught uh, people who advocate for an asceticism and perhaps a sort of uh, Jewish component to it, restraining from certain foods. Uh, and so that's this doctrine that Paul most directly refers to. Uh, however, are there other demonic doctrines out there? I think just by, uh, by way of application, I, th- I think that we can apply this to, to any doctrine uh, that is a lie. And, and I would qualify that a little bit. Um, because remember, we had this interaction on this episode to probably qualify, and, and we're just, we're guessing a little bit here, we're, we're really kind of filling in the blanks, uh, but uh, it would seem as though to qualify as a doctrine of demon, it probably has to be a first tier doctrine that uh, that is uh, unorthodox. Okay? But, you know, is it, let, let's say, if it comes down to egalitarian versus complementarian, the role of women in the church, or if it comes down to 
Uh, we'll just use that one, something like that. It's, is it a doctrine of demons? I don't know. I think it's a fair debate to have because I, I think that isn't a, a doctrine that really matters. Well, um, you think there are different categories of doctrines of demons, like first tier and lesser doctrines of demons? Like one is going to get you into heresy. The other is going to get you into some bad orthopraxy. Uh, orthopraxy. Yeah, I, maybe. I'm just, I'm just thinking an egalitarian scholar such as uh, uh, Dr. Keener that we have a two- with every week the book of mark you guys need to check that out like doctor let, let's imagine that we're right of complementarianism okay that uh that male headship in in and in marriage this is a biblical doctrine let's just imagine that we're right we're right but let's imagine that we're right that mean that dr keener is demonized because he believes differently than them, than us on that i i don't think so uh yeah so that, that's where I struggle on some of those kinds of things. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, Michael, it does seem like your audio may be cutting in and out. Are you having, guys, if you're watching right now, are you having that problem with my audio and Round or Miller's as well? Or is it only uh, Michael Roundtree's that seem to be coming in and out? We might have him log out and then re-log back in just to, so that we have you know fluid speech. Uh, but it does seem as if he's cutting out as he's speaking there. So um, yeah, let me know in the comment section if you guys catch a difference so in our in our speech. But let me let me ask this question though um you know if, if we had 10 people in a room and they all read the bible uh they could come out with 10 different interpretations of a given passage okay and that's not to say that the scripture um uh, is ambiguous it's to say that the people are fallen right um certainly there are passages that are harder to understand than others uh but people are fallen sin has affected all parts of our faculties our discernment um it's affected our um, our logic, it's affected uh, the way that we understand. Our, our, our flesh tries to pull us into sin. Uh, we aren't by nature uh, children who follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so we can chalk up, you know, misinterpretations. I think the vast majority of misinterpretations to human error. Um, that being said, it does seem that the Bible is clear that there are spirits who want to lead us away from God. So we were talking about first tier, second tier doctrines. I think that we're really talking about things that are leading us away from uh, the God of the Bible, right? The false prophets in, in Numbers and in Deuteronomy that we're warned against are those who are leading us after other gods. They're not just wrong about some things. They're they're leading us after other gods and the worship of other gods. Uh, in, in, in 1 John chapter 4, uh, we see, uh, you know, 1 through 3, he says, if there's a spirit that professes another Jesus, that Jesus didn't come in the flesh, he is, you know, uh, th that person is anathema. The, the text doesn't say he's anathema, but but they are. Uh, they are an antichrist spirit is what John tells us. If anyone who comes and says he has not come in the flesh, they preach a different Jesus, then we're not to believe them because that doctrine is demonically inspired. That's someone trying to lead you after another God. And, and when you begin to attack the core principles and fundamentals of the Christian faith, uh, certainly as they pertain to the divine nature of God, Trinitarian doctrine, Christological doctrine, uh, I would say that those are certainly uh, areas where you can open yourself up to demonic activity. But I would say that another one, uh, certainly uh, would be uh, practicing other uh, other religious uh, practices and introducing them, kind of syncretizing other religions into uh, our faith. Uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, we're encouraged not to uh, uh, contact the dead. We're not taught to practice necromancy. Why is it that we're not supposed to practice necromancy? Because others were doing it, and it seems like it could be done. Uh, so we're not supposed to contact the dead. And opening ourselves up to communicating with spirits that aren't the Holy Spirit is not something we're told to do in the scriptures, but we are told to do in other religions. It looks like Michael is in and out. I want to see if Michael's in there. Michael, you still there? I'm back. Can y'all okay, hear me? He's back. I can hear you, but we'll see if it, can if hear it, me. it, it cuts up or not. I'm, I'm so happy about that. Well, uh, hey, Josh. So I think that, first of all, you make great points. Number one, but number two, uh, I think you have some clips uh, to play for us that would be examples of what we would categorize as demons. Would you say that's safe to say? Yeah, I think that most of these classify in that in that camp. Um, I think that there's some of them have different degrees of error than others. Um, but yeah, uh, y'all wanna y'all wanna jump into the first one? Yeah, yeah. Okay, this is Dave Hayes. 
which is actually really funny because Michael's old youth pastor at, at Wellspring, his name was David Hayes. Um, we, we got a good no, laugh out of that. So David, no if you're really. watching, we, we just, it was a, anyway, here we go. Dave Hayes. Now we're getting to the fun stuff. <laughs> right. So you can travel in the spirit in a number of different ways. Uh, some people actually physically travel, their body travels. Some people... Hey guys, it would be worthy mentioning if you're in the car watching with kids, maybe shut that off. Christian language, not Christian content. Be careful. That is, I, I allow you to resume your reg, regular content. Basically travel in, in, in the spirit, their spirit travels, but their body remains where it is. Um, that's, that's much more common. Like I, I pray for people. Like I said, I, I get a lot of prayer requests. And um, a lot of times when I'm praying for people, uh, here's, here's another example. I was praying for a guy in Africa uh, one time, and I was praying for him, and he sensed me in the room with him. He felt like someone was standing next to him, had their hand on his shoulder, right? And, and it's, it's a little bit difficult to understand because if you're, you, you think, okay, if you're not traveling physically, why would someone see a physical manifestation of you there? Well, spirit beings, our spirit, can manifest and look like a physical body. Uh, this is what happens with angels, right? Angels have a spiritual body. And demons have a spiritual body, but they can manifest in the natural and they can look like they have a solid human body um, because this, the, because the physical dimension is of a lower vibrational frequency. All a, all a spirit body has to do is lower its vibrational frequency and it will appear as a physical body rather than a being of light. And, and I know that sounds kind of new agey, but that's really what it comes down to. If you just look at it scientifically, um, it's, it's the frequency of vibration of the particles that are determining whether it's visible in the visible light spectrum you understand the um the light spectrum ultra uh, sorry uh, infrared and ultraviolet waves okay you can't see anything above certain uh color of violet because it the the light particles are vibrating too fast you can't see them they're invisible same thing with infrared it's the frequency of vibration and uh so translation by faith is we we use that term uh, i i use it interchangeably with traveling in the spirit Translation by faith is, uh, you know, we, the, the kingdom of God is all about faith, right? We heal the sick by faith. We prophesy by faith. Everything we do is by faith. Faith is a currency of the kingdom, right? So if we need to go somewhere and do something, and uh, we, we need to, like, be there, uh, by faith, we believe, we believe, we put our trust that God is going to take us there, and we're going to do what we need to do. And you can, you can do it using your will. Um, Using, exercising your will, you can go places in the spirit. I've done it quite often. We, it's really easy to forget this, but uh, since we are primarily a spirit, we have a soul and we inhabit a body. Okay. Our spirit is in the spiritual dimension all the time. We don't ever stop existing in the spirit. <laughs> it kind of seems that way sometimes. Like if you have a dream where you, you travel somewhere or the Lord picks you, your, you up, takes you somewhere, you're suddenly aware of the spiritual dimension. If you have a vision, Suddenly, you're aware of angels and demons, but those things are always there. Your spirit is always in the spiritual realm, moving, interacting with demons, angels, even though you're not aware of it. Your mind isn't aware of it. Your spirit is interacting with spirit beings all the time. First, in dreams, I was doing it almost involuntarily. And then, you know, the Lord was like, you can do this voluntarily if you want to when you're awake. And that's when I started to engage the spiritual realm and started doing some experiments on my own. And uh, yeah, if you... If you put this into practice, it can become a very normal thing. But like I said, yeah, it started with me for dreams. That may not be a uh, case for everybody. I know of a few other people who haven't done it much in dreams at all. They, they just do it when they're awake. And they have these experiences that go places and, and see things and talk to people. Again, uh, when the Lord started talking to me about portals, I was like, what the what? <laughs> you know, uh, I didn't have a grid for portals at first, but I did have a grid for hearing God's voice. So he very gently and very uh, gingerly taught me uh, about portals. Uh, and, and portals are essentially, uh, my understanding of, the, of it is that a portal is a passageway between God's kingdom and the physical realm, really. Uh, a lot of people, when they have near-death experiences, they travel through what they describe as a portal or a tunnel from the earth plane to heaven. And they see the light at the end of the tunnel and they come out in heaven and then they come back. Well, that's a portal. It's a passageway between God's kingdom and the physical realm of the earth. So uh, the Lord has been kind of teaching me about portals and there is, uh, he's kind of suggested to me that 
portals serve a, uh, a purpose that things go through the portals. People can go through the portals. Spirits, angels travel through portals, and so does Revelation. And I had an interesting experience one night where I was on the road, uh, and I was actually, I, was, I don't speak a lot uh, publicly, but I was speaking at a conference. And I got to this hotel, and um, I wanted the Lord to speak to me while I was on the road. And, and, and sometimes that's kind of hit and miss. Like when I'm at home, I have a lot of dreams. And it's like my angels know where I am and, and God knows where to find me, where to send the dreams to. He's got my, my, my post office box. But when I'm traveling, I'm not at hotels. I don't always have dreams. So that night I was like, you know, I really want to have a dream. And the Holy Spirit said, well, why don't you speak a portal into existence? I was like, do what? He goes, speak a portal into existence. And I was like, can I do that? He said, of course you can. You're my kid. So I spoke a portal into existence in the hotel room. And that night, I had the craziest dream. Um, revelation came to me in this dream where I saw the effects of people's prayers 5, 10, 15, 25 years in the future. The Lord showed me these people praying, and then he showed me the effect of their prayers in the, in the future. I've never had a dream like that. But that night, I prayed for that portal, and boom, I got this crazy uh, dream. It was quite extensive, and there's a lot of revelation that I received. So I, I started just you know, again, a newbie, but not knowing much about this, started playing around with it. And um, it's, it's a, it seems to be a real phenomenon uh, that there are certain places uh, and there, there is a way in which revelation can come to us through a portal. Like I said, angels come through portals. Uh, I don't know if God's manifest presence comes through portals. It might. Uh, I haven't really looked into that, but um, yeah. And, and we can travel. <laughs> like I said, when people die, when they have a near-death experience, they travel through a portal into the heavens, right? So we can do the same thing. Our spirit can travel to different places through portals. Um, in, in the heavenly realms, there's actually a lot of doorways and hallways um, in the courts of heaven and things of that nature. And there, hallways are basically portals. It's a, it's a place that joins one place to another. Okay, so this is something worth mentioning at the top of this. Um, if you're in the comment section, what I want to ask you to do um, I understand that there's going to be some people there that have righteous indignation. There's others that are going to want to mock and scoff. Uh, what we want to do is we want to approach the scriptures with a level head. We want to listen to this. We want to dissect it with discernment. Uh, we want to have love for Dave. And we want to have love for people that are following Dave. But at the same time, we want to bring a balanced approach to say this is not a biblical practice. Um, so that being said, uh, this video was uh, filmed uh, by Sean Talbot. Uh, Sean is actually, I've met him. We've had coffee at a coffee shop. There's a photo of him and me on my Facebook, I think. Uh, and he went and filmed this gentleman and they published it on his YouTube channel and on Destiny Image, the company that he works for uh, or works with, I think works for and with. Um, but yeah, that's where this footage can be found. You can go watch all of it. You'll see that there were cuts in it. I, I took the, the parts of the video. It's a 30 minute video. I took the parts of the video that I found that were the most egregious. But if you'd like to go look at it in context, his name is Dave Hayes, and you can find uh, that full video there on Destiny Images YouTube page, uh, just for source material. Okay, gentlemen, who wants to start first? Sure, I can go. Um, it's so hard to know where to start, but uh, I'll, I will start by saying this. I am absolutely grieved. I'm grieved that a Christian would put this on a webpage. I'm grieved that millions upon millions of Christians would follow this and think this is a good and godly thing and is somehow going to lead them to uh, greater intimacy with God, maybe, or greater power or blessing in their life. I don't know what their hope is, but, uh, but this is utterly new age. I mean, if you read any new age material, they're into portals, they're into vibrations. There's a reason why we don't see these words in the Bible. You see it in the Passion Translation. This is what we're so concerned about. Go back and watch our, uh, our video on the Passion Translation, is that you start including New Age terminology into your movement and then codifying it into the Scripture, and it just starts to become part of the vernacular and the norm uh, that this is astral project projection, this is spirit travel. Where in the Bible does it ever tell us to travel in the Spirit? Uh, he does say that, you know, some people travel physically, like with their body. It's a reference uh, probably to Acts chapter 8, where Philip is preaching in one place, and then suddenly he appears in another place. It seems that God somehow translated him. He appears in a place called Azotus. Um, there's also a reference in 2 Kings 1, where um, 
where so the company of prophets is kind of like, where is Elijah? Well, maybe the spirit of the Lord moved him from here to there. Uh, and so there are some instances of a physical movement of somebody in the scripture. Um, but the spirit travel, there's actually not. I, you, you can look at Paul who was caught up into the third heaven, um, which is basically heaven. And, and he does say whether I was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. But the thing is, you see a place where body by their willpower actually doing this right that's nowhere in the bible and and what it 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 suggests is that and this violates the the doctrine of the sufficiency of scripture second timothy 3 16 to 17 all scripture is god breathed and useful teaching rebuking correcting and training in righteousness so the man of god may be thoroughly equipped for every good work what we need for a godly life, this is sufficiency of scripture, what we need for a godly life can be found in the scripture. It's not like, oh, there's this, this secret tactic that we just picked up 2,000 years later so that we can now live a blessed and godly life. Paul didn't know about it. Not even Jesus knew about it. But hey, I know about it. And it's this brand new thing. No, that, that doesn't cut it. If you can't find it in the scripture, this is not something that you need to practice as part of your somehow pursuit of God and God's blessing. So it reeks of new age. The language uh, is new age. You heard him quote the courts of heaven. We're going to look at Robert Henderson later. Um, it It's just, it absolutely grieves me. I'm trying to look at my notes here, see if there's anything else that I missed. I, I've but, got some um, thoughts. Miller, do you want to jump in there? Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, so let's just say that some of the stuff that he's experiencing is real. Like there, let's just suppose for instance, that portals are real, that, uh, that people can travel through them, whether in the body, out of the body or that messages can be sent. Sorry. That's my son playing a marble upstairs. Uh, just supposing that's Passing true. Passing through a portal. I don't, right. <laughs> uh, so what? I think that the problem, so I had a, a buddy of mine asking me, well, if we're supposed to, you know, pray for the sick, then why can't we travel in the spirit? I mean, you see this happen to Philip. Um, and, and I said, well, the, the difference is, is we're actually told to lay hands on the sick. That's right. We're not told to travel through portals or travel in the spirit. That is something that God, if he does take people places, which I think he does, um, it's passive. It's not active. We don't like our volition. Our will doesn't play a part in it, which is actually what he said, just the opposite of. Um, you cannot find a single example in scripture of our will playing a part of translation. Uh, you can see examples of scripture where people lay hands. Their will is literally involved in that transaction. Um, so I think that's a major part of this. Is it active or passive when it comes to Peter? It says he uh, was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Or like he fell into a trance. That's a passive thing. John uh, was in the spirit on the Lord's day and he, you know, he saw there was a, door open in the heavens and a voice speaking from that door. Um, but again, these are things that happen to these people, not things that they made happen. And then when it comes to creating a portal, he mentioned, well, you're my kid. So of course you can create a portal. Well, how far does that rule extend? Um, you're my kid. So of course you can, and then fill in the blank with whatever you want. Raise the dead whenever you uh, want. Uphold the, uphold the universe right. by the power of your word. Right. There's just a, a number of things that God does that you're now assuming you can do, which uh, to me gets into, I mean, it, it's somewhat akin to little God doctrine. Um, yeah. So, sorry, go ahead, Josh. I think I've, I've spoken up on that. Oh, no, I, I just, I wanted to kind of give, um, I love the sci-fi sci world, right? As much as the next guy. And um, if I was going to live in a science fiction world and look at the spiritual realities of the Bible, and I was trying to make sense of them, with a 21st century mind and a, you know, long history of sci-fi, um, then you you might try to make sense of natural, um, like angels travel. They, they don't seem to be able to teleport wherever they want to go. You know, there there's a ladder in which they come and go from, it seems, you know, in, in one text. And, and then one has to travel to Daniel, has to get to Babylon, go through the Prince of Persia. Persia somehow uh, resists this angel. He doesn't just teleport instantly there. Uh, it seems as if he's traveling from one place to another. He eats with, a a angels eat with Abraham. Um, angels seem to have relations with women in Genesis 6, if that's your interpretation. So you have these texts where angels are physical. Um, 
So if you were going to look at that and go, well, how can they be spiritual and physical with a 21st century mind, you may attempt to scientifically say, well, vibrations, right? If you hold the string theory, if you hold to, um, uh, again, he was mentioning ultraviolet, uh, ultraviolet rays, uh, those are um, certain color spectrums that we can't see. Um, and those things exist. There are colors and light patterns that we don't see and we can't see. Um, and, and it seems as if even the scriptures, when they're describing colors, they're using things like like this and a color that looked like that. It wasn't even something that they could really quite describe uh, the radiance of said colors. So is it possible that angels live on a kind of natural uh, space uh, because they're confined to the laws of nature? They have to eat. They have to travel. Uh, they can reproduce potentially. That would be really trying to take a 21st century worldview and applying it to the scriptures that the scriptures themselves don't actually make. Uh, me and Elijah Stevens have been talking about this in great detail because, again, with a sci-fi kind of mind, I go, well, why not? Why couldn't it be that way? And, and Elijah's had some really good pushback. Uh, you'll, you'll notice that there are films out there like Thor and Doctor Strange where the, the magicians, the sorcerers, they don't pull on demonic energy. Right? What they do is they pull energy from a different dimension. And what happens is they remove all of the um, wicked, evil stuff from magic and make it natural. And today, that's what's happening in Wicca. That's what's happening in in, in occult practices and in, in kind of modern sorceries. They go, oh, no, no, uh, it's not dark magic. I'm not trying to hurt anybody. Uh, uh, this isn't demonic. I'm not pulling on demonic spirits. What I'm doing is I'm pulling energy from a different dimension, right? So what we do when we do that is we, we neutralize the Christian worldview to to apologetically reach people who are practicing occult or new age things. So is this individual coming from the new age and applying new age teachings to Christianity? I don't think so. I think what this guy is doing is he's got some cursory knowledge of science and is trying to apply that to the scriptures, which again is not something that we're supposed to do. That's called eisegesis, not exegesis. We're not pulling data out of the text. We're using our worldview and reading into the text. So I think it's equally as dangerous as trying to mix uh, new age teachings in. So I'm gonna I'm gonna be a little bit more gracious hey. in saying it blurs the lines unnecessarily. Um, yeah. Hey. Hop yeah, in there. that's good. So, Josh, I, I have a number of things that I just have kind of been thinking about. I'm gonna try to talk fast because uh, we also have two really good questions uh, that I'm gonna want to address. You could, to cue these up. One is by Lucas Miller on First Corinthians five four. The other is by T. Trevor on Genesis 28, 17. So I'd like to address those in just a minute. But before I do, a couple of issues that, uh, I, that I see in this video that I haven't mentioned yet. Uh, one is it's Gnostic. This Gnostic emphasis of spirit over 100%. body is if body bad, spirit good. And you know when he says we are primarily spirit, uh, it, he, he makes it seem as though our body is a bad thing, but that's not what the scripture teaches. Jesus's body was a temple of the Lord. It was a, it was a temple, destroy this temple in three days. I'll raise it again. John chapter two, verse 19. Uh, and now in the same way, first, uh, first Corinthians teaches that our body chapter three, our body is a temple as well as chapter six. And then, uh, and then the entire church, Ephesians two, 19 to 22, the entire church is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and so, uh, and so that's the body of Christ, but, uh, but actually to come back to our human body, our human body is good. This is a big part of what the incarnation was about. It was Jesus affirming, yeah. I have not given up, uh, on material creation. I started out and I created the material world. The book of Job tells us that when the material world was created, the angels sang for joy. This, this whole new bizarre thing, matter. And so God creates this material world. The angels are singing. It's this wonderful thing. And we see it in Genesis. It is good. It is good. It is good. And the climax of it, it is very good. Satan comes in and corrupts the thing. But, you know, then the Gnostics come in and say, well, you know, all of the flesh is still bad. But Satan doesn't get to win this. There's coming a day when this is going to resurrect the entire physical universe, Romans chapter 8. Uh, there, there's coming a day when he's going to resurrect our physical bodies. Physical matter matters. It is a good thing. And this guy talks as though it is a bad thing and that we're primarily spirit. We're not primarily a spirit. Where does the Bible say that? We are body, soul, and spirit, 1 Thessalonians 5. So uh, first of all, that's just plain false. And, and if we want to talk about portals, these passageways from heaven to earth, 
again, I come back to, uh, it, it's not a passageway. Like my, my body is a connection between heaven and earth because Jesus Christ lives inside of me. I am a house of God. And so are you, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus and the same with the gathering of the saints on the Lord's day, uh, we are a temple of the Lord. And so, uh, if you, if you want to look where to, to the, the places on earth where heaven and earth truly meet, it's, uh, it's wherever there is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are the so-called portal. But let's not use the word for, uh, portal because the Bible doesn't use it and New Age does. Uh, I just think it's a bad word. Um, I, I, I want to say that I think this, is, this may be heresy. I, I'm one of the people to throw that word out, uh, but it's just super close to it. I, I just have trouble with it. Uh, and, and here's why. We don't base our teachings upon personal revelation. We base teachings upon written revelation. That's right. There is a place. There is a place for personal revelation. You know, 1 Corinthians 14, we prophesy, uh, and, and there's a place for that. We see it all throughout the book. Of, but we don't see someone getting the personal revelation and then making a teaching based upon personal revelation. That should be red flags all over the place because that's Joseph Smith. That's Mormonism. That's, I mean, all kinds of cults are rooted in a personal revelation that, is, that we base our teaching in. We don't base our teaching upon the mysteries and riddles of personal revelation. We prophesy in part, we know in part. We base our teachings upon what the scripture right. says. Okay. So I want to say those things. Now I want to address, uh, and then I'll start like 10 minutes after this. Uh, I want to ask a few questions. Uh, one from Lucas Miller, 1 Corinthians 5 4. He says, is 1 Corinthians uh, 5, 4 a proof text? Uh, uh, and, I, and I wrote the verse out. Like, uh, so for, for what Dave Hayes is teaching here, it, it, here's what 1 Corinthians 5, 4 is. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my, here's the key part, and my spirit is present with the power of the Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may, uh, may be saved in the day of the Lord. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5 is a story about church discipline. And uh, there's a guy who's stepping or sleeping with probably his stepmom, uh, his father's wife, okay? Probably his stepmom. And the Corinthians are tolerating it. And Paul's like, you've got to discipline this guy, which is an excommunication, which he's calling handing the man over to Satan because the, the, the church is a holy place. And for somebody to be excommunicated from the church is to put them in Satan's playground. And now it, the, the ultimate goal is for it to be remedial, for it to actually bring the person uh, back, to be restorative. But the relevant phrase is, my spirit is present. That does not mean that the Apostle Paul astral traveled to Corinth or that he's planning to astral travel to Corinth in order to help with the excommunication process. No, this goes back to a, uh, a biblical principle that, once again, the community of the saints is the meeting place between heaven and earth. It's the idea that you see in Hebrews chapter 12, where the context gathering of the saints. And it says, uh, and so the, the, and the, the point there is that when you gather, and there are thousands upon thousands of angels and festal assembly, and, uh, and the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and uh, it, and and there are all these things happening. The point is that the church on earth and the church in heaven is worshiping together whenever we gather on the Lord's day. And so when when Paul is saying this in First Corinthians chapter five verse four, he's saying, "My spirit is with you in the sense that uh, that on the Lord's day, whenever we gather, we're in a sense all together in the heavenlies." Heaven and earth become one, and we're all part of the eschatological assembly. Go back and check out our episode called The Sacrament of Assembly. It's a fantastic episode. Uh, next question. And I've talked a lot of Miller. Do you or Josh want to take this? Did Jacob think he found a portal in Genesis 28, 17? Or do you all want me to just start it out? Um, let, me, let me just kind of give some thoughts on what you had said earlier, you know, you could make sure. the case that it was personal revelation, but you'd also make the case that he is appealing to group think, group experience, um, and and the testimonies of random persons, right? He, he mentions near-death experiences as uh, this is proof of portals. Okay, so you're taking a bunch of accounts of both Christians and non-Christians about their experience of death as, a, as evidence for portals, 
Um, and then I've had other people that have this experience. And, and one of the things that you'll notice in his storytelling is he'll say, at first, I didn't realize that anything was happening. I was just dreaming. And then people started saying, hey, thanks for coming and visiting me. Or, hey, thanks for praying. And he goes, what do you mean? And they have to explain to him as he was dreaming last night, he came. And well, as you tell these stories and they become more popular, when people have these odd occurrences, they're going to attribute it to their friend who's able to spirit travel unbeknownst to him. So they're they're feeding into his confirmation bias. So you've got group think of individuals. You have people who, who believe this myth, who keep reaffirming the myth every time something odd happens. Now, the question about Jacob's ladder on whether that's a portal, um, are we denying as Christians that there are these convergent spaces where heaven and earth meet? No, we're not denying that uh, as Christians. Uh, is it potential that there was a space where Jacob was and God opened his eyes to see uh, a place where angelic activity was coming into the earth? As I mentioned earlier, uh, it appears uh, in the biblical text that we have in Daniel, I believe it's chapter 9 and 10, uh, an angel comes to deliver a message to Daniel. And as he's on his way, he is resisted uh, by the prince of Persia. Uh, that means he traveled from one location to another. That means that he had to come from somewhere, right? So uh, I, I don't think what we need to do, though, is create this massive cosmology of the earth and say, this is a this is a portal area, and that's a portal area, and we need to work a portal area. We need to pray that God would open up portals over our churches so that we can have angelic activity. There's a difference between saying maybe that there is a space where heaven and earth meet in a unique way versus saying that there for sure is a space and we need to pray it into existence. We need to work with that portal. Uh, but I don't think Genesis is trying to get us to think that if you go to this place that Jacob let his head on this rock, that uh, there's definitely an angelic portal there into heaven. I don't think that's what the author of Genesis is trying to get us to, uh, to take. Miller? Yeah, the other thing he mentioned was that we go and we do these travel exploits uh, because of our faith. He said, faith is the currency of heaven, which I believe is a Bethel teaching, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I would actually argue that the way he's defining faith is different than how the scriptures would. Like he said, you have to have faith that you can travel there and you'll travel there. Um I don't believe that faith is the expectation of a particular outcome. I believe faith is the confidence in the goodness and kindness and character of a person. Agreed. And because of that, you may have certain expectations. But for him, again, it's about mustering up psychological certainty that you're about to, to fulfill some exploit. And so, and I, I categorically disagree with that. I think it's, that is word of faith type faith, not faith that is in biblical a person. Right. Yeah, and that's that's one of the things about these videos is you're going to see metaphysical claims, you know, oh, we're always in the spirit world. Oh, you know, our spirits can manifest in physical bodies. Oh, you know, like uh, uh, we know that the, these things are portals because of near-death experiences. There's so much that's just assumed that you don't see a proof text for, you don't have a biblical account for, and then when they are biblical verses kind of attached to them, they're way out of context. You, you never... So, so it, it's worthy of mentioning that there is a ton of metaphysical worldview that he is assuming is true based off of personal experiences and testimonies of others. But we're at 43 minutes in and we have got to push through these videos. Do you guys want to go guided meditation or Kat Kerr next? Yeah. Um, I just say we go a little long and we just cover them both. I don't care. Done. Okay. Joshua Mills first. There are specific angels that are assigned as spiritual guardians and protectors over your life. The Holy Scriptures confirm this. For example, Psalm 91 says, Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. He will cover you with His feathers. He will shelter you with His wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. What are these feathers that the scriptures are speaking about? And who do these wings belong to? Of course, we know that God himself doesn't have wings, but his angels do. One of the ways that God promises to guard you and keep you safe from all harm is by covering you with the feathers of his angels and sheltering you underneath their majestic wings of protection. 
This truth is further clarified in verses 10 to 12. Here we see plainly, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home, for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. In other words, you have guardian angels assigned to protect you. God has assigned them in your life from the very time that you were born. They surround you as you work. They travel with you when you journey. They sit with you when you rest, and they watch over you as you sleep. God has given them charge over you. They care for you. They love you. And they want to see you succeed and fulfill your destiny in life. This truth is confirmed in Psalm 34, verse 7, when it says, For the angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds and defends all who fear him. Your guardian angel is your friend. They will always defend you, protect you, support you, and watch over you. Because that's the assignment that God has given them to do. According to Hebrews 1 verse 14, the Bible calls them servants, spirits sent to care for people. Consider this. Your guardian angels know more about you than any other person on earth. Do you think God might want you to know your guardian angel as well? I do. Right now, let's ask God to lead us and guide us by his Holy Spirit into this truth. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you asking for greater clarity regarding the truth about the guardian angels you have placed in our lives. Help us to see, sense, discern, and recognize these servant spirits that you have sent to care for us. Amen. Now I want you to relax and focus as the Holy Spirit begins to lead you into this truth. As you rest, you can trust that God will begin painting spontaneous pictures and images across the screen of your heart. Do you see anything? What do you see? Are there any colors, patterns, or shapes that you recognize? feel the comforting peace of God surrounding you right now? Do you feel the brush of the angel wings or the breeze of spirit wind? What do you discern? Are your guardian angels tall? Do they have any wings or no wings at all? Are they wearing brilliant white robes or holding anything specific in their hands? What do they want to show you? Keep looking. Do you recognize your guardian angels? Sometimes they actually look just like you. Okay, I think we had we had like another two minutes of that, but I mean, it's enough, let's, dude. We'll give him credit it's enough. that it's really I'm tapping soothing. out, dude, on that. Well, it was really, really <laughs> soothing. I think I was getting kind of like sleepy. So we'll, but there was all kinds of feelings <laughs> I had when I was listening to that. Not just sleepy. Um, yeah. Okay. So in this clip, we have a gentleman who, um, and if you go, I took a clip. Okay. This is a clip. You can go watch the whole thing if you want the source material. And I'm not saying when I said the source material in the last video, I wasn't saying go make sure you go learn all their material. I'm saying if you want to hear the context and the full content. Um, I think as Christians, part of our job that we sh we we often do in the political space um, wrongly is that we hear a soundbite that we like and then we go, oh, look how evil and awful that is without going to see the full context of everything. Um, and we condemn people without knowing the context that things were set in. Um, I think that the context uh, is bad. Uh, that's why we're showing this video. But we do need to do our job if we're going to talk publicly about these things that we actually see the source material uh, 
rather than just watching the clips on Remnant Radio. Um, anyway, I'm gonna turn it over. Miller, do you, do you wanna do you wanna dive in first? Because I feel, I'm I afraid if I give it to, to give it to, if I give it to Roundtree, you'll never get the ball, buddy. Uh, no, I, I actually don't have much to say on it. It just it's just weird. Um, yeah, <laughs> again, it's it's so this he passes idea to Roundtree. Like active, I, I yeah, you. I do. Well, it's an active versus passive thing. It's like, how much of a role are we supposed to play in making stuff happen with angels? I just, I don't, I don't see that. I see angels showing up. I just don't see us playing a major role in whether they show up or not. Unless maybe, you know, prayer, prayer and fasting, you know, Daniel, when he prays, an angel was dispatched, but he wasn't praying for the angel. He was praying for an interpretation of a dream. Well, the opening verse that he uses is Psalm 91, that God shelters you in his wings. Oh, but God doesn't have wings, but angels do. Like, no, actually angels don't have wings. Not a single record in the Bible, the word angel and wings. Like there's no wings on angels. You go, okay, cherubim or, or these other creatures. Well, uh, check out Michael Heiser's stuff on this. There are cosmology of spiritual beings uh, in the heavenly places that the Bible gives us an understanding of. Angels don't have wings, um, but neither does God. But this text in Psalms 91 is talking about God's wings but it's using it anthropomorphically. It's using it symbolically to say like, like, you know, like, you know, a, a mother hen an gathers eagle. her chicks, if you will, like an eagle's strong breath. Like it, it's, it's a, it's a symbol. It's, it's imagery. It'd be like me saying, like you know, is... the strength of Michael Roundtree's beard or no, that would work. I kill Some, you. Something, something oh, else. Dude. Something else. Uh, it's time for a premature graying hair joke about Josh. Well, I think about <laughs> so. Um, yeah, Josh, you you did take the words out of my mouth. Not the beard part, but the wings part. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. We'll talk about the Psalms. This is symbolic. This is this is such a layup here. Um, I I'm sorry, but to say that uh, this this comment about God having wings and feathers, it also talks about God having a shadow in that verse. Uh, well, surely God doesn't have a shadow. He's a spirit, uh, but angels are spirits too. So they don't have shadows. So where are you going to go with that? I, yeah. James so says that there's missing... no shifting shadow in him. Yeah. So the, he, he's just completely mistaking it. That's just on an interpretive note. Another interpretive note when he, uh, he quotes Psalm 34, seven, it says the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers him, uh, as a guardian angel verse. Uh, but Almost every New Testament scholar I know, maybe everyone, I've never read one who thinks otherwise, um, considers the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament to be Jesus, because okay. the angel of the Lord is interchangeably referred to as the Lord, and he has this sort of physical human-like representation. So uh, people would uh, people generally say it is the, the angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate Christ. So this uh, uh, Psalm 34, 7 does not appear to be about a, an angel in the sense of what he's talking about, a, a random guardian angel. No, this is the angel of the Lord who in the Old Testament is the Lord. Um, I think my biggest, uh, biggest concern uh, when I look at this is Colossians 2, 18. I'm telling you, Josh, you, you, you volleyed it over to me and you didn't put a shot clock on me. So here I go. I've got a new um, button so still. Colossians... If you get out of hand, I'll just, I'll just shut that mess down. <laughs> <laughs> so Colossians 2.18, it says, Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism uh, and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. Now, to be fair, uh, Joshua Mills repeatedly says things like, hey, we don't worship the angels, we're just thankful for them, and, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, but you know, I did a little word search on uh, on this word, this Greek word for worship, and it's used throughout the rest of the New Testament. Uh, to it's translated as religion. Uh, I think that's Acts twenty six, as well as James chapter one. Pure and undefiled religion is this. So, um, worship in the sense that we're thinking seems to be maybe the most narrow uh, translation of that word, but it also can just be more broadly, sort of like. You could think of this as an angel religion. And that's kind of what this sounds like. It kind of sounds like an angel religion. And what Paul is getting at here is when you when you come across somebody who's constantly talking about my vision, my vision, my vision, my 
I saw this angel and the angel did this and we got to seek the angels. We've got to travel here in the spirit and do these things and our visions and all this stuff. He's saying, if you go back and read Colossians 2, these people are detached from the head. The substance is found in Christ. And I just want to say, where's Christ and what these people are saying? Where's the gospel and what these people are saying? Uh, I'm going to say these are dangerous teachers. They're detached from the head who is Christ. And if you listen to them and if you follow them, you too will be detached from the head who is Christ. And I would strictly warn you not to follow these teachers. Yeah, and I think that it would be worth saying as well that in this guided meditation, we're told to close our eyes and imagine what does this angel look like, ask the angel its name. We're not told to commune with and speak with spirits. Uh, in fact, we're actually told to be cautious when spirits reveal themselves because it could be a, a, uh, an angel of darkness portraying itself as an angel of light. We should be cautious not to open ourselves up to these kinds of spirits. Uh, that would be, again, my my major takeaway. Uh, if you watched Joshua Mills' entire video, you'll see at the very beginning, he makes uh, uh, well, the beginning of that clip that I showed you, he makes a big deal about Jesus and faith and repentance and, and turning to Jesus. And that's what the first section, we listened to like the second clip from his, you know, hour long, hour and a half long guided meditation. That, that being said, the guided meditation is just that. It is a new age practice. You don't see this in the historic Christian faith. You see this in with shamans. We see this with, with systems where, okay, we're going to empty our mind and we're going to use our imagination. We're going to engage with this thing. And there's nothing wrong to dwell on Christ, to think of Christ. But we have a person who, through messaging, is trying to input images into your mind. Uh, that's an entirely different sort of situation. Uh, and again, I'd be very cautious to be practicing something that we can see on TV it is always practiced not by Christians, but by people who are looking to meditate in some kind of Eastern religion. Um, so, so yes and amen. Let's not go on in great detail about uh, angels. Josh, clarify this for me. When yep. you say that guided meditation, they're implanting images. Uh, which is what he did. You know, what is this angel? What does it look like? Imagine the colors. Um, what, how would you distinguish between that and what many Christians practice, what we practice as prophecy, which is oftentimes, or, or words of knowledge, things like that, which for us is oftentimes things that sort of come out of nowhere, images that take place in our head, visions sure. that feel no different than the imagination. Um, how do you differentiate between the two? Yeah, so like we mentioned this earlier when it came to portals, we are not trying to translate ourselves in the spirit. We're asking God to give us an image. And when something random pops into our head, we pay attention to that random thing. Uh, opposed to uh, let me meditate and think about angels. Uh, let me think about the face of the angel, the shape of the angel, the, the wings of the angel. Does the angel look like me? What's the angel's name? We're trying to conjure something in our imagination. How, how of, tall is the angel? I don't know if we got angel. to that part of the video. How tall is the angel? Yeah, we, we're, we're trying to four. imagine descriptors. And I've got, a, I've got a wild imagination. I can imagine literally anything. Uh, Oh man, I want to do a Michael Scott quote. I won't. Um, I know. That's it. I was thinking that too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I was four, I drew a horse with a spike through its head. It's a freaking unicorn. No, I'm so creative. Anyway, um, <laughs> all that to say, all that to say, uh, there's a difference between asking God to speak to us uh, and then God speaking to us through some form of impression uh, and trying to imagine something. And again, I would say that there's something even different between looking at the biblical descriptors of who Jesus is. Okay, he's got eyes like fire. His hair's white like snow. His face radiates like the sun. His feet are like burnished bronze. He's got a sash on his chest. Okay, like looking at those kind of biblical descriptors and meditating on those, I wouldn't find sinful either. But when we're asked to meditate on things that the Bible doesn't describe, like the, the Bible doesn't describe angels in great detail any more than it does any human in the Bible. Uh, there's hardly ever descriptors of people unless they're typically negative. I say negative. It's important to the storyline is, is what I'll say. Um, yeah, well, and, and the Bible just straight up never tells us to do this. If this was really important for our spiritual life, the Bible right. would have told us to do this. The Bible never tells us to do this. Therefore, it's not important for our spiritual life. And I would add it's dangerous for our spiritual life for all the reasons that we've said. Why don't we play that Cat Kerr clip and we'll finish with that one. Okay, this is a video that we have played in the past. I did a video on traveling to heaven where I just just 
zoned in on a certain teachings, this one's worth replaying because when you say, well, hey, you're just beating up on Josh Mills and you're just beating up on on, Dean, uh, on, on Dave Hayes, you're, you know, you're not being really fair with these guys. You know, they're not really going that far, are they? It turns into this clip, right? When when there is no biblical reference, it's just experience, it turns into this. And we already know that there's places in heaven that represent seasons on this earth. He took a shadow of a place in heaven and made it a whole season on this earth, like the winter time. They have Christmas town in heaven. Yes. There's a fun place for you. Uh, and the summertime here on the earth, that's the shadow of a wipeout surf park where you can ride 80 foot waves and you're not going to die. <laughs> uh, that's the fun part. It's funny how most of these have fun parts. And then there's a mountain of spices in heaven where fall oh. is always there. And you can go on horseback rides up into the beautiful fall area. Every level is another aroma. The mountain of spices is also mentioned in the Bible. You need to find that scripture too. And so uh, that's another thing that he took a shadow of and made fall on this earth, which we're entering into that season right now. I'm looking forward to seeing it. But yes. I've seen the one in heaven, and it is amazing. And, of course, there's spring. And let me tell you, spring is a shadow of the friendly forest in heaven where the trees sing, the flowers will dance with you, even the rocks cry out and worship him. And so, also the field with the the copter flowers. That's right outside the friendly forest, yes. by the way. As you're entering into the friendly forest in heaven, you come down this big hill, and there's these tall flowers. They look sort of like huge daisies. Yeah. But the face of the flower is faced upward into this to the sky, and people run down this hill into this field of flowers everywhere. They grab the stalk. Because these flowers are like six foot high. They'll grab it and it takes off into the air and takes them like a flower copter. That's what they call them. And it will carry you from there into the friendly forest. So That's so cool. Because in heaven, the cows drive the tractors. <laughs> Go ahead and laugh, Jen. I love it. <laughs> if you have any children up there like three and over or two on up, uh, they always take them to the fun farm because it's where they learn prophetic art. They learn art. They actually have art classes. And this is the wild thing about the fun farm. Yeah. It's got to be different, right? It can't be like yeah. on the who, earth. Who are the art instructors? The art instructors. I love this part. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I died a long time ago to myself. I don't have my own opinions. I can only share, share what I saw. The rabbits. That's right. Hello. The whole bunny thing and the colored egg thing and looking for them actually comes from heaven. They put all the kids in this big wagon that the cow with coveralls and a farmer's hat drives them to the art barns. It's only going to get better, so they don't go anywhere. <laughs> this is either giving you a joy and celebration or ammunition. <laughs> don't waste it on us. We don't listen to the blasting stuff. And here come these five and six foot tall rabbits every color of the rainbow you can imagine they have aprons on they have all kinds of things in the pockets that they're going to give out to all the children are so excited because they know they're going to learn art but they don't know what they're going to be doing what kind of art they're going to be doing and before they even arrived these rabbits were busy because they were going out into the fields. They're picking up these eggs. These eggs are like ostrich eggs of that size. They're all white. Every one of them's white. They're putting them in these baskets. So when the kids come, they pass them down the tables. And all the kids take a couple of these eggs out. And then they have a little mat to set them on. And the angels then begin to give them the brushes. These are brushes. They look very much like brushes on the earth. Except for one thing. They're not sticking them in little containers, plastic containers of paint. Because what happens is the, the paint is colored light. It's like liquid light. And they're all different colors. And they appear right in front of the children in the air. And they can take and dip their little brush in it. And they begin to paint these eggs. Every yeah. kind of color that is possible. And they put flowers on them, smiley faces. They probably make them into minions. You know, if they currently went there, currently, if they currently went to heaven, they use all the new stuff that we have. Yeah. You know, 20, 30 years ago, there were no minions. No. But now there's minions. 
So the painting like swirls all up and down the egg, rainbows, whatever it is. Then they'll hold it in their hand and they hear this little sound. And the teacher will take the top part of the egg off and out of that egg into the, into the rabbit's other paw will come either a baby chick or a baby rabbit. Yep. And those baby chicks and rabbits will be the identical color of what that rabbit painted the egg. So whatever they paint the eggs as, out will come these little chicks and, and bunnies from these. And then the kids start yelling. They are so excited. They want to finish those eggs. These, these mushrooms, they get to sit on like seats. Yeah. They all sit on a little mushroom. They find all the children. And they're all facing in one direction because they're going to see a concert of the flowers. And they'll sit there. And these mushrooms, because this is a supernatural place. So we're, we're kind of late on the show, so we're going to wrap that up. Um, you can watch the whole clip on that video that I had recommended. A um, couple things in this video. Uh, there's prophetic art in heaven, even though when the perfect comes, prophecy passes away. Uh, it doesn't really make sense for why you're seeing Christ face to face. You would need the gift of prophecy. It doesn't really make sense. Uh, we don't listen to blasters. It's just convenient because you're you're saying some of the most grievous and uh, uh, aberrant things that have ever been said within the Christian within the Christian faith. I, I I don't I don't know how you can say that with with a straight face and, and actually think that you're helping and edifying Christians somehow. Uh, you got cows driving tractors. You've got rabbits teaching prophetic art. You, you've got you know Easter everywhere you know you've got kingdoms made of jello you can eat mailboxes i mean the things that she says in this video are the most absurd grievous things uh that are i mean if i was to be a person who wanted to mock the christian faith and mock a charismatic space i would release prophetic words like this have four hundred thousand people following me on elijah list there's millions of people that watch these videos I mean, it's absolutely absurd and the charismatic movement if they don't start speaking out a bit against some of these uh, aberrant teachings oh they're just going a little bit this way into portals you're going to find yourself nope. in jello kingdom space pretty soon mm, yeah absolutely hey guys i apologize my video glitchy i think everyone in my neighborhood's at home on the internet because it's snowy and icy outside uh but yeah josh i feel the exact same way i want to appeal to those who are platforming Kat Kerr. She is mentally ill, guys, and you're putting her out there and she's just showcasing it. This is a, a, not a lack of discernment and compassion. I mean, I just, I feel sorry for her. Um, it, it's just sad to see somebody parading their mental illness for the entire world. Uh, she needs help. Um, right. Still, we have to address what she says. Um, I mean, the, the lunacy of the thing she says, I mean, we could go on and on. I'll, I'll talk about just the biblical scriptural side uh, and, and where I see some contradictions. She repeatedly said, you got to check out the mountains of spices and where that is in the Bible because they're all over heaven. Uh, that's just awkward. Song of Solomon, uh, the last verse of it, uh, chapter 8, verse 14, says, Make haste, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or young stag on the mountains of spices. Most interpreters understand that to be a request for the man to make love to her. The mountains of spices would be her breasts. So if that's all over, have, I, I don't even know what to say to that. Uh, the other thing is that uh, I just didn't hear anything about Jesus. All this talk about heaven. Where's Jesus? Where's God? Is that even of central importance to heaven? It made me think of this quote from John Piper a long time ago. And I just think it's such a fascinating and important question for us to all ask ourselves. Uh, here's what he says. He says, the critical question for our generation and for every generation is this. If you could have heaven with no sickness and with all the food you ever had on earth and all the food you ever liked and all the leisure activities you ever enjoyed and all the natural beauties you ever saw, all the physical pleasures you ever tasted and no human conflict or any natural disaster, could you be satisfied with heaven if Christ was not there? And it sounds like these visions. It sounds like, That's oh, right. jello kingdoms and all these wonderful things. And uh, you can do anything that you want. And I, but where's Jesus? It's missing the picture of what heaven is actually all about. It's about uh, being with the Lord. That's how Paul characterizes, characterizes it in 2 Corinthians 5. Right now, I'm away from the Lord and present in the body, but I, I long to be with Jesus. Philippians chapter one, I want to be with Christ, which is far better. Uh, that is the 
great hope and the Christian longing that we might be with Christ, not that we might, you know, slide down a hill of jello. It's just silliness. So I Miller. liked uh, Dawson's comment earlier when he said, uh, it's crazy to me that I'm finding it difficult to get a job at a church, and yet this lady has a ministry. Um, which someone also hired Dawson. is kind of, yeah, yeah, someone hired Dawson, which is kind of telling because he's right. Uh, this kind of stuff sells. This is the stuff that's drawing the charismatic crowd. And if you honestly think that the spirit travel and uh, going to heaven stuff doesn't lead to this, well, I'm going to tell you you're wrong. I literally watched it happen. I watched this stuff get taught at, at a former church. And then I watched people start taking, you know, underwater trips on unicorns and rainbow roads uh, in underground taverns of water uh or people slaying dragons and pulling treasure out of their bellies i literally heard these reports of people in that community that they were doing these kind of things and it's because they started listening to uh, teachings by guys like ian clayton and justin abraham i'm not i'm not exaggerating mm. when i say this um this is the kind of stuff one does lead to the other and it becomes a world where the gospel itself gets sacrificed you get more caught up in the visions and these experiences and the drive to share the message of the gospel, a sanctifying message about how Jesus Christ can uh, both die on a cross for your sins, set you free yeah. from your sin and give you new life. Like that message itself um, gets lost in the shuffle of heavenly jello experiences. Um, yeah. One really it, does lead to the other. I'm not exaggerating when I say that. And it's not anecdotal. It is I've seen it consistently throughout a period of time wow. when this stuff is taught. So let me let me ask some questions wow. real quick. All of you guys charismatic, right? You all believe in the yep. gifts of the spirit? Okay. Yes. So mm -hmm. you can be a charismatic and have discernment and say no. Like we can say right. no. No more. This is the line. We're not going to cross it. And that's the space mm -hmm. that Remnant Radio is trying to fulfill. We're trying to encourage charismatics to be brave and to speak out and to resist error. Uh, because the only way the charismatic movement will be primed to continue the, the world's largest salvations of souls, it, not a single movement uh, has had the kind of widespread effect like the Pentecostal charismatic movement. Uh, they've stretched the four corners of the earth, bringing the gospel with signs, wonders, and miracles, and it has brought glory to Christ's name. It has delivered people of sicknesses and diseases, uh, but this kind of gangrene if it is not cut off, it will shipwreck the faith of Christians. And we have to draw a line and say no further. This is not mocking, scoffing. This is what brothers do who love the body of Christ. You stand up and you say no more. This is too far. Um, you know, you get to the point where you're like, you stop buying the books from the publishing companies that promote this garbage. You stop listening mm -hmm. to the stuff. Uh, uh, from the networks that support this garbage you reach out to them and say hey because you support this person because you so you know you you've published the passion translation i'm not you using your app i'm not using your platform i just wanted to let you know you, you go out there and you push on these things so that we can actually make a difference because remnant radio for for whatever reason god's given us grace to reach people on this platform we're not the answer and we're not going to be able to cause a solution on our own uh, I really want to encourage you, if you're out there and you're in a charismatic space, encourage your pastors to speak out against error. Uh, encourage that, that bookstore, encourage that publisher not to release these things because they're leading people into error and it is gangrene. Uh, it is affecting people's mm. faith. Uh, I want to get some closing thoughts from you guys and then we'll wrap this show up. Michael Roundtree, what are you some closing thoughts, buddy? Yeah... Uh... I, th I think for me, it's just, let's get back to the gospel. Let's get back to Jesus Christ and him crucified. First Corinthians chapter two, verse two, I resolved to know nothing else among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And in how many charismatic churches is it just floating away into charismatic land talking about all these fantastical dreams and visions? I have dreams. I have visions. I prophesy on a very, I mean, certainly weekly basis, not quite daily basis, but I mean, all the time I'm prophesying to people. Listen, I believe in all the things, but, but even the spiritual gifts themselves, Ephesians chapter four speaks of 
Christ ascending to the right hand of God and then pouring out gifts upon men, the gifts themselves point back to Christ who purchased them for us through his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. And I just want to see preachers, I want to see ministers talking about Jesus all the time, not talking about fantastical, angelic, heavenly sorts of visions. They've lost touch with the head. And Christians, we have to say stop. And we have to say stop to the publishers, echo everything that you just said, Josh. Stop to all of that stuff. It is absolutely dangerous. And uh, and let's just make it about Jesus again. Miller? Yeah, I'm going to say amen to all of that. I think uh, the reason I got into the gifts was because I was leading uh, a Young Life team at Bryan High School and asking the question, you know, there are 3,000 people at the school. If one miracle can see 4,000 come to Christ in one day of a, a paralyzed man, then why not that at Bryan High School? Yeah. Um, that was my hope. And I think that's the beauty of the gifts of the spirit is they're meant to strengthen the body so that they can endure persecution and hardship and, uh, and in continue to encourage them to have faith in Christ that he really, really will raise us up with him. Um, and then they're also meant to help others to know that Jesus is both real, that he really did die on a cross for them. And he really did rise from the dead to give them new life. That's the beauty of the gifts. It's ways to love people with power and specifically to love them with the gospel. It, it opens the doors for evangelism unlike anything else I've seen. And so I think um, a lot of this stuff has just, it, it's gotten off the rails. Like it's not headed in the same direction and it's headed towards something totally different. And that's what's sad about all of this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a pure God is worthy of worship. A pure gospel is worthy of defense, okay? Um, if the gospel tells us about God, uh, eternal life is to know uh, a God in Jesus Christ whom he has sent, John 17, 3. Um, it's worthy of defending that gospel because that gospel tells us about Jesus. So um, we we need to be discerning. We need to be aware. There are doctrines of demons. There is deception. We're warned about it. And we need to have our discern discernometer uh, uh, ticked to attend in this age. Guys, thank you so much for watching this episode of Remnant Radio. I would really encourage you guys to subscribe to the channel. Make sure to like it, share it around if you think it has been beneficial to you. Uh, additionally, uh, in the links of the description, if you've been blessed by our ministry, you can support on PayPal as a one-time gift, or you can be a recurring gift there, giver there on Patreon. It's as low as five bucks a month to get access to extra content, uh, such as videos on discerning spirits from different perspectives. That would be super helpful. Additionally, we do have that book, uh, Though Man May Not Perceive It. It's a free ebook. You can download it in the link of the description. Uh, just the different ways that God speaks that we see in the scriptures uh, and the ways that we can begin to perceive the way that God speaks. I uh, hope this episode has been edified, edifying to you guys, uh, and we will see you next time. And thanks, Mikey and yep. Mikey, for coming. Next Wednesday, religious spirit. Oh yeah, Miller's Miller's heading up. Yeah, the religious spirit. He's an expert. Yeah, okay. blessings. <laughs> <laughs>